Hi everyone, thank you for joining us online. When someone says, I don't believe in God, think about responding, which God is it that you don't believe in? Because the God described by so many people doesn't look much like the God I see in Jesus Christ. So close your eyes, picture God. Is he smiling? I hope by the end of the series, you will be. Thank you for joining us as we discuss our good and beautiful God. We know that God is generous. I don't know if I have to say that. You know that God is generous. And we know what generosity looks like. I remember where I was on 9-11 in 2001. And I'll tell you, it's amazing as we get older. And you start talking to you know, college kids and you ask them, do you remember where you were? And some of them are, no, nobody does. It's pretty incredible how as time goes by, what seems like happened only yesterday. You know, happened so long ago. I remember where I was. And I remember the stories that came out days and weeks after that tragic, terrible event. Stories of people volunteering to drive up and make a difference in people's lives. Huge trucks full of things to help people who are without house and home. I heard of uh, actor Steve Buscemi, who's an actor who was a firefighter back in several, several years ago who decided to go spend several weeks back with his old group, trying to make a difference in people's lives. We know what generosity looks like. We also know what it looks like on the other side of the spectrum, and that is what happens when you feel like you don't have enough. Generosity seems to come out of a sense of abundance. I have more than I could possibly use here. Take some. Scarcity is what happens when you feel like you don't have enough, and so you grab. We know what scarcity looks like. Do you remember where you were not that long ago when you heard that because of this thing passing through called COVID, everything's going to have to shut down? And so we looked in the corner and we noticed that we had grabbed that extra amount of toilet paper that we didn't really need, but we thought we might need. Or that stockpile of hand sanitizer, because we think we might need. And it wasn't that we were trying to take it from our neighbor. We were just thinking about ourselves. That's very common. Scarcity describes what happens when the music stops at the end of musical chairs and you watch what everybody does. That is what happens in a condition of scarcity. Every man for himself. Grab what you can. When you feel like you don't have enough, we tend to take, we tend to hoard, and we tend to focus inward. And it's not just money and stuff. It's a really great quote uh, from James Bryan Smith. Our checking account is limited. And often our money <coughs> is spent before we earn it. Living from a condition of scarcity, we learn that we must protect what we have. And if we give it away, we might end up in dire straits. That's not just true with money. What does it look like spiritually when we're living from a condition of scarcity? It makes it very hard to love others. It makes it hard to love yourself. Love seems so scarce. Forgiveness feels scarce. I talked about some of the great stories that came out of 9-11, of generosity. We know that. We also remember what happened when fear set in and neighbor had trouble trusting neighbor. And what happens when fear takes a hold rather than love? Acceptance is scarce. Forgiveness is scarce. Love is scarce. Last couple years, we've witnessed difficulties in our country which people seem to line up on a side. And no longer is it the opposition, the other side's the enemy. It's defense all around. It's winner take all. We grab and claw with tooth, nail, and pitchforks because it feels like what we want, we don't have, what we hope for, we're going to lose. And we live 
from a condition of scarcity. But how would it be different? How relaxed would we feel? How open would we be? How different would life feel if we didn't operate from a condition of scarcity, but from a condition of abundance? What if we really thought that we had more than we could possibly imagine? Way more than could be used or held in a lifetime. And then we couldn't help but let that ever-flowing stream of goodness and generosity and hope and love fill the streets where we're living. What if we saw people in terms of God's greatest hopes for them rather than our worst fears about them? What would it look like to be people of unlimited generosity? I think it would look like the kingdom of God. We know that God is a God of great abundance. The widow, in one of the Lord's uh, stories, the widow of one of the prophets, found herself in dire straits. This is in 2 Kings chapter 4. She had no money. The creditors were coming to take away her two children and turn them into slaves to pay off her debt. Things are terrible. So she cries out to the prophet Elisha for help. What do you have? asks Elisha. I don't have much, she says. I don't have any money. What I have is this small, small jar of oil. I'll tell you what, says Elisha. Go home and ask all of your neighbors for any empty jars they have. And then fill them with your oil. So she grabs every empty jar she can find and she begins to fill. And she's not done filling. With that small jar of oil she began with. And after all the empty jars are full. It gave enough to pay her creditors. It gave enough to keep her kids out of their hands. The Lord kept giving. Jesus had a bunch of followers and it was time for dinner. Maybe we should send them back to go back into the city to find, take care of themselves. Well, that would defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? Because he's the great shepherd. And so Jesus looks at the apostles and he says, what do you have? They say, well, we have, we have five pieces of bread and two small fish. That'll be enough. Tell you what, feed the people. Feed the people and then get some baskets to pick up what's left over. And after 5,000 men had eaten their full, there was enough to fill 12 baskets full of the fragments. My God loves to bless, and he loves to bless in abundance. And in the kingdom of God, we don't live in the condition of scarcity. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Give, said Jesus, and it will be given to you. And not just given to you. Listen to this analogy. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church according to his power that's at work within us. I don't just mean that God gives to his people in abundance. I mean he gives of himself to his people in abundance. When we ask, he gives. And when we ask again, he gives again. When we think we must, he must be tapped out. I've asked for grace way too many times. That sin I said I would never do again, I did again. And I'm asking for forgiveness yet again. And the text goes out of its way to talk about the abundant grace of God by putting it this way. But God gives more grace. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, writes Paul in Romans 5. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. We know that. 
We apply it to our business needs. We apply it to our financial concerns. We trust that God will get us over the hump. But don't you know, don't you know that God is abundant and generous with his grace and mercy, not only on how much he gives to us, but on how much he gives to others. We know, writes Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, we know that the one who raises the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, writes Paul, so that the grace, the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. I want people, says Jehovah. And years later, Israel would read those words and misunderstand. Israel would read God saying, I want a people, and they'd say, oh, he's talking about me. And Israel thought of themselves as a cistern, a cistern, a well, a place where anybody in the world could look and see and say, oh, God's got a people, and it looks like he loves them. It's over there. But that was not what God wanted. If you go back and read Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he makes a covenant with him. He says, you're going to have more kids than you can number stars in the sky. But get this. I will bless you. I'll make you a great nation. And I'll make your name so great so that you can be a blessing to others. Listen to Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Not a sister, an aqueduct. I want a people so that I can fill them with my presence and love and grace so that through them the whole world can experience blessing and love and grace. When Solomon dedicates the temple, the temple of the Lord, in the midst of God's holy people. He prays a prayer of dedication and includes this fantastic line in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Foreigners are going to hear about you and your mighty power, and some of them will come to live among your people. And if any of them pray towards this temple, listen from your home in heaven and answer their prayers, then everyone on earth will worship you, just as Israel does. And they will know that I have built this temple in your honor. Not a cistern, an aqueduct. And if you won't be my aqueduct, I'll just bypass you. I'll bypass the system, says Jesus. He enters the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. He reads from the prophet Isaiah, and he reads a, a statement where the prophet says, There's coming a day. It's going to be the year of our Lord's favor. He's going to give. He's going to give. He's going to give. And you're going to declare this is what it looks like to be under the favor of God. And then he says, guess what? That's being fulfilled today. And the people can't wait. They know how the story is supposed to play out. That means God's going to come to Israel. He's going to bless Israel. Israel's going to beat up on the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to be overthrown. And then Israel's going to reign supreme. That's how the story is supposed to go. But Jesus says, let me tell you what it looks like to experience the year of the Lord's favor. Remember when there were a bunch of widows in need? God passed by all of them in Israel. And he went and he helped a widow in Zarephath near Tyre and Sidon. Remember when leprosy was all the rage? And many men in Israel were in need of healing? God showed up to Naaman the Syrian. And the little cisterns couldn't stand it. They dragged Jesus to the edge of the cliff. They wanted to throw him off for daring to suggest that the day of the Lord's favor just might have Gentiles in mind. But God loves all people. He's always wanted to help all people. I want all of my creation, everyone I've made, says the Lord. I want my saving grace to extend as far as the curse is found. And one day I'm going to open the floodgates and my people will be found in the Messiah. Jew and Greek, 
slave and free, male and female. But from the beginning, he wanted to bless all people because my God is more generous than we can possibly imagine. And so we meet Jonah. The man tried to run away from God and was swallowed by a specially prepared giant fish. If he came to Circe and we offered him seafood, he said, no thanks, I've been seafood, I respect it. Jonah wanted to run away because God told him to preach to the worst people on the planet. Told to go to Nineveh. Assyria would later take the children of Israel into captivity. They would be known for sticking fish hooks through the nose of the leader, tying it to a rope, tying the other end of the rope to the back end of a horse, and then having the horse drag the king up and down the streets as all the people cheer. That's what Assyria is going to be known for. And the capital of Assyria is Nineveh. Jonah's knees can't stop knocking. So he runs away. But after three days in the belly of the whale, with the stomach acid working on his skin and prayer working on his heart, Jonah was being prepared for a whale of a tail. Jonah preached in Nineveh, and Nineveh repents. What could make a people like this repent? I guess if I was walking along the beach, and I saw a big fish spit a guy up on land, and the guy, stark white from all the stomach acid, dusts himself off, waves at the whale, walks over to me and says, repent, I guess I would. But Nineveh didn't receive any condition in the preaching of Jonah. Read it twice. God tells Jonah to say this. Forty days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. That's what they deserved. That's the line Jonah preached. That's the message God gave but these pagan kings, they didn't know any better. <coughs> they hadn't been to preacher training schools. They hadn't been to graduate seminaries. They hadn't had all the creativity and the appreciation for the awesomeness of God. Get sucked out. Now these pagan kings think that God's personal. And maybe, just maybe, if we change our ways, we show that we're serious. If he's powerful enough to make us, what do we got to lose to ask if he's good enough to save us? And God looks down and he sees their hearts, people made in his image, his children who have refused to be his children, now crying out to Papa, have mercy. And God says, yes, that's what I want. He saves the town from annihilation, the worst town on the face of the earth. And the only guy in the entire story who's upset about all this is God's spokesperson, Jonah. You have to laugh when you read it. Quote, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he was going to bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. Can you believe it? I'm not finished. Look in chapter 4 and verse 2. You're going to see language you've seen before. A couple of weeks ago, we read it in Exodus 34, where God describes himself. Here's Jonah basically quoting Exodus 34, but using it as an insult. Jonah to Jehovah, I quote, O oh Lord, didn't I tell you this was going to happen? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the very beginning, because I knew you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. He means this as a criticism. Oh, here's the kicker. Just take my life. It's better for me to die than to live, implied line. 
with a God like you? What was Jonah's problem? He didn't just want to preach damnation. He reveled in it. His world didn't make sense without God's wrath displayed every time it's deserved. But praise God because of Jesus Christ. God's wrath, which we all deserve, has been averted. Sometimes, sometimes in our desire to preach the whole counsel of God, we can preach in a way where it sounds like, looks like we were baptized in lemon juice. You know what I mean? Nothing positive to say. It's hard to believe. But for some, they just can't stand the idea that God may offer salvation to someone who's worked less hard or lived less pure or loved less dearly than I have. So we sit on our hill and we wait for the day when God's wrath will take care of our enemies. When we do that, we look more like Jonah and less like Jehovah. Hear the story about the carpenter from Nazareth who said, quote, God did not send me into the world to condemn the world. That's John 3, 17. I came that the world might be saved. Hear the father speak lovingly to the older brother. All that I have is yours. Don't you know that? But I thought your brother was dead and is now alive again. He's come back to life. Won't you celebrate with me? When one sheep goes wayward, won't the good shepherd leave the 99 and go after the one? Even so, there's more rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents than 99 who need no repentance. And so the book of Jonah closes with God, teary-eyed, pain-hearted, wanting his servant Jonah to love what he loves. Is it right for you to be angry, says God? Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left? It's an upside-down kingdom, and it's marked by abundant generosity. The Ninevites move one inch, and God moves mountains. Peter was baffled by Jesus' teachings on the high calling of God. I mean, he had just suggested that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And because of that, Peter says, I don't get it. Look, we've left everything to be your followers. What are we going to get? And Jesus comforts him. Yes, you become my followers. I promise you, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everybody who's left everything and forsaken everything for me, they're going to get 100 times as much. I want to encourage you in this. I know that you love me. I know you're dedicated followers of me. Your future's secure. But I also have hopes, high hopes, for people besides you, for people very unlike you, for people whose track record isn't quite like yours. And you need to know this. In my kingdom, many who are now first are going to be last, and many who are last are going to be first. And so he tells them a parable, a very unusual parable, about a man who hires workers in his field. And he goes out in the early morning, and that's when you get the folks who really want to work. They're up there. They're ready. They're looking for a job, and he hires them. And he promised them, if you'll work for me for a day, I'll give you your money. He goes back later in the day and gets some more. These are probably the people who either slept in or didn't look like they were going to be good enough to work all day. And he hires them and says, if you'll work for the rest of the day, I'll give you your money. And he goes with only one hour left and he says, hey, you who are left, will you come work for one hour and then I'll, I'll give you your money. And the text says that they all did their job, and at the end of the day, he gave them what he promised them. And he started with the last first. When the workers arrived, the ones who had been hired at five in the afternoon were given a full day's pay. And the workers who had been hired first thought they'd be given more than the others. 
And when they were given the same, they began complaining to the owner of the vineyard. The ones who were hired last worked for only one hour, but you paid them the same as you did us, and we worked in the hot sun all day long. And the owner said, friend, I didn't cheat you. I paid you exactly what we agreed on. Take your money and go. What business is it of yours when I pay them the same that I paid you? And then here's the interesting last line. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? Or are you envious because I'm so generous? Peter, I love the full day workers. I love those church members who tell tales of how their fathers and their father's fathers and their father's father's fathers served as elders here. I love stories of people who were basically born on a pew and they've gone on to at least one mission trip every year and they've read through the Bible 20 times. I love them. I love what they've done for me. I love those who can say with sincerity, I've kept all of the commandments from my youth up. What lack I yet? I love them. I do. I want them in my kingdom. But I also want your neighbors. I want those who spent the last decade in riotous living. I want the prostitute on the street corner. I want the tax collector who threatened your family this morning. I want the Gentiles, the ones that lord it over you, the ones that you wish I'd destroy. I want them to sit next to you in the kingdom of God. That's what I want. Will you be angry with me? What would you have me do? The thief comes only to rob and to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. Will you celebrate with me? And here's the kicker. If only we could actually see just who we are in the story, it would change us forever. We're not the 99 just people. We're not the full day workers. We're the Gentiles who came in at the last minute. We're the sinners standing in need of repentance. We're the people Jesus saw at the last hour and said, I want you to. Do you know what was Jonah's problem? He saw the Ninevites as them when he should have seen the Ninevites as us. My God is generous. He's opened the floodgates of heaven to offer salvation, pardon, cleansing, peace, forgiveness to those who want a relationship with him, to any and everyone who will take it. When our focus is on ourselves, on our list of accomplishments, on our checked off boxes, it's easy to live in a condition of scarcity. But when our focus is on him, his desire to bless the whole world, his work outside my circles, his relentless encouragement of goodness everywhere we find it, it's easy to live in a condition of abundance. We begin to see God at work behind every rock. We begin to see goodness being done and God getting glory for it. We begin to see opportunities to share Christ with our neighbors. And we begin to see what's good in others and what's bad in ourselves. And that Christ says, I don't see you in your sin. I see you in your Savior, and I want to see them that way too. And when the world sees that, when they see us giving, 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 loving, 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 and they say, how could you love me? How could you give to me? After all I've done to you, we answer back, because my Lord keeps giving to me. He keeps giving to me after all I've done to him. He doesn't know how to stop, and neither do I. Our God is generous. Will we be? Thank you again for joining us this morning. No one has ever loved you like Jesus Christ, but we at Westside want it to feel mighty close. Would you let us know you're out there and watching? You can write to us at prayers at wschurch.net. Tune in next week. We're glad to have you.